I said, um, I said, I have to be in this film. I think it was one of very few that really captured the essence of life in the big leagues. It's very touching. It's a good baseball story. Room for people that don't like baseball, don't know anything about it. Oh, Rexy, I don't think this one got the distance. People love this movie and say it's the most honest kind of clubhouse feeling of a baseball movie that I've ever seen. Well, I guess there's only one thing left to do. Win the whole fucking thing. It's great entertainment. It's really fun to watch. I think Major League still resonates for a bunch of reasons. The picture has stood the test of time. Spectacular. He just caught the essence of a baseball team struggling and then overcoming their, you know, their problems and winning. I mean, it's just a great story. It's had a life outside of just its movie life. Just a bit outside. He tried the corner and missed. And that, that part of it's really gratifying to me. It's my kind of team, Charlie. It's my kind of team. <laughs> The idea for Major League came from basically being a long-suffering Cleveland Indians fan. And I figured that, uh, you know, given their history, that the only way that they would ever win anything in my lifetime is if I made a movie where they did. And I knew it had to be a comedy because the, the chances of it actually happening were pretty slim. So that was, that was the genesis of Major League. The great thing about David is he's such a huge fan of baseball and knows the game inside and out. David understands the game within the game. And so the film would not have had the feelings that it had if, if David didn't have such a love for the game. Welcome to another season of Indians Baseball. The process of getting this picture made was much more difficult. It was a much more arduous, um, you know, road than I think people would think now. The reason for this was that there was a studio mentality, which was that if people are really interested in baseball, then they'll go to a game. Let's stay with him just a little bit there. Yeah. So then you can let him walk out because I'm going to cut into Vaughn here. Well, I wanted to put together a team of players that not necessarily reflected any current Cleveland players but were sort of hybrids of players that I knew, players that I'd heard about. Hey, what do you say, preacher? These guys are doing a baseball movie here. Hey, In my opinion, one of the big things David brought to Major League was just the casting. Look at this cast. I mean, is there, it's, every, it's like everybody is their character. You know, Serrano, for example, is a, is a combination of uh, Felipe Lou, Orlando Cepeda, you know, Wade Boggs, who used to eat chicken before every game. You know, any player who had a superstition. Willie Mays Hayes, he wants to be Willie Mays, but he's not a power hitter. So he was more patterned after a player like Ricky Henderson, base stealer, flamboyant kind of guy. Nice catch, Hayes. Don't ever fucking do it again. All right, let's go. I put together a group of players I thought would be interesting and tried to give each one of them a problem that had to be solved. They look good. Besides, seeing's the most important thing, son. I don't think it's that important. We put all the players through about a two-week baseball boot camp. That was run by Steve Yeager. He put them all through pretty rigorous baseball, sort of a baseball academy. Oh, we, put, we spent six weeks with, with Behringer and Sheen and uh, working with those guys. And we went to a regular spring training uh, procedure. And when you got actors got out there doing it, and it looks authentic, it's even better. I mean, what can you say about the guys that's gone out there that are easy to teach? Having Gager there was great because they were there to help our ball players to look more authentic in everything they did. Couldn't have done the picture without uh, Steve Yeager. He took this sort of ragtag group of actors and really made them look like a team. It certainly showed a little bit in the playing, but it also showed just in sort of the allowance or the spirit that the guys had as players. They felt, by the time we started shooting, they really felt like they were a team. If, if he does gel the team together, it's usually out of humor and, you know, just a kind of guy that everybody likes. He's able to talk to everyone. I got a call from Charlie, actually, and he, he said, are you going to do this? And I said, yeah, yeah, I mean, I think it's fantastic. He said, yeah, I like it, too. And I said, well, let's do it. We had just, you know, come out of the jungles of the Philippines together doing Platoon, and so um, it was nice to do a movie with him where uh, we could interact and actually be friends and teammates and like each other and not always be at odds. Tom was great. The only problem with Tom was he hit the ball well. He did not have a great throwing motion for a catcher. Being a catcher and being in that crouch position and throwing guys out at second base, 
Not many actors could do that, no matter what. I remember telling Yeager, I said, my lower back is just killing me, you know, with a sciatic nerve. And he goes, yep. He says, we all have that. He says, that's why nobody can catch an entire season. He says, it's like just keep switching off with two catchers. And he says, it'll go away after, after you're done. But it's just sitting in that crouch is not a normal, that's not a normal crouch. I think Tom, you know, part of what makes this movie so successful is he's got these kind of real characters. Until you get to me, then it's all BS, you know. I play a guy named Roger Dorn, who's a professional baseball player. He's a good, probably was very good in his prime, but he's lost that competitive edge. Corbin was great. Just knew how to make Dorn be such sort of a self-satisfied, you know, guy. Look, I took one of those in the eye last year. I'm not about to lose my sight. I'm deeply moved. Where L.A. Law was the sort of same sort of character with money, very good at something. He had a very sad side to himself, a very, you know, uh, you know, when the doors closed, I always thought that Arnie Becker and L.A. Law lost it. I made an extension in that this was comedy of saying, no, this is Roger Dorn. He's on top of the world. There ain't no, he's never lonely. He's never sad. He's never upset. So I am not about to risk major injury or to face this property for a collection of stiffs. Corbin Bernson, I had never met before. I'd seen him on L.A. Law, uh, but one of the funniest guys. I ever worked with. I mean, just stirrup. We used to have a thing because, and I hope this doesn't make you look too closely at the DVD, but uh, I didn't want to wear a cop because I just thought it just makes your packet look too big on camera. I don't want to be going, hey, check it out. And, you know, I just thought it looked goofy. You gonna see that? Okay, okay. How about now? <laughs> My arm got incredible during that. I still never improved my hitting, though. I've always been a lousy hitter. That's why I never played baseball. Corbin Burnson, he had such a good spirit about it. Wonderful ball player. I've heard Corbin speak about his baseball ability. He's very modest about his baseball. And uh, it's just not true. He's a tremendous player, and I think it shows in the picture. Oh. Can't really reveal the plot. But this is unlike any other baseball film ever put together. Ever. <laughs> First of all, Charlie's an excellent ball player. Making him look like a real pitcher was not a problem. He knew how to pitch. In baseball films, especially, especially dealing with a pitcher, because you can teach people how to hit, you cannot teach people how to throw. When they got a pitcher that, that doesn't know what he's doing, they start shooting him in here real tight. When you got a guy that has done it for a long time and understands the, the mechanics and the fundamentals, you can shoot him full body, which is what they were able to do. It was, he was like a major league starter. We could only pitch him every fourth day because there, there was actually one day where he threw 121 pitches. By today's standards, I mean, you know, should we have been on a pitch count? Probably. But, uh, but that's a complete game into extra innings. And uh, that was pretty hard. Charlie was a, I mean, we all knew that he was a good baseball player. He's a phenomenal baseball player. I've seen subsequent movies where, you know, not to name any, but, you know, so many throws. You know. But Charlie was throwing. He was pretty gung-ho about it because he loved baseball. And you kind of estimate this, but I'm guessing his, his fastball was 88, 89 miles an hour on, on his best days. Charlie was, a, you know, he was in the middle of his, you know, early Charlie Sheen days, which was like a, a chick magnet and every other thing, so, you know. There's always stories about Charlie, about what a character he is, and people always say, well, you got to tell me some of the behind-the-scenes stuff. Well, the behind-the-scenes stuff was that this guy was just a complete professional who, uh, at times when other people weren't exactly acting that way, helped us to sort of, not only was he concerned about his own character, but he truly was concerned about the movie. Charlie brought a lot to the, to the film, you know. You watch the film and it's about wild thing. It really is. Both Tom and Charlie had not really done comedies. So for them to start to do, be starring in a movie that was very comedic, uh, a lot of people didn't think that would work. But both of them have great sense of humor and Charlie is he's just a funny guy. Check. Wesley Snipes and I play Willie Mays Hayes. A total, total imposter who loves to play baseball. They never heard of him. He wins. Double zero, because he can't hit, can't catch. 
he can run. That's about it. So that's how he gets on the team. Say hey! Billy Mays Hayes here. Wesley was completely unknown at the time. I think he'd done one or two pictures. Most interesting thing about Wesley as an athlete is that while very athletic, he wasn't necessarily that fast, but he looked fast. So it, it, it worked perfect for his uh, base stealing character. Excuse me, I gotta take my first step toward the Hall of Fame. He learned how to how to swing under the ball and hit pop-ups. And to consistently hit pop-ups is not easy, and Weston learned to do it, and he wasn't really a, even a ball player. Make no mistake, when you see some of those plays in the field, when you see Willie Mays Hayes going back and making a catch, that's Wesley doing that. Back goes Hayes, jumps and makes a great catch! Crisco. Bardall. Vagisil. I pitched in high school and college. Uh, in college at Southwest Texas State in San Marcos, I never really had the stuff, but, uh, but I loved the game. Uh, we established the fact that this guy was supposed to be an old junkie. And he was throwing every kind of garbage that he could think of. You know, he has that sort of herky-jerky mode. You know, some of those things you do with running your fingers through your hair and doing this number and, and all kind of little ticks that might be a tip-off that the guy's loading something up. Harris winds and delivers. Vaseline ball swung on and grounded to short. There's an interesting thing in the evolution of his character, which is that his character originally was even more religious than what we finally ended up with. You trying to say Jesus Christ can't hit a curveball? I like very much the idea that Eddie Harris in the middle of the prayer says, Jesus Christ, Serrano, have to wake up now. Okay, shit, can we try this again? It makes him a human being instead of a cartoon Christian. We tone down the religiosity a little bit with Chelsea's character, which I think ultimately works pretty well anyway, because at the end of the day, his character isn't a real nice guy. So... <laughs> Up your butt, Joe Boo. He's the right fielder for the Cleveland Indians, and uh, he's also the slugger for the team. And he hits fastballs very, very much, but he has a little problem with that curveball. So I would just come up with this, you know, with this accent, and you know, and it would work for me, you know. So I understand, you know, and, you know, because what I'm going to do is this, man. I'm going to go up to the plate and I'm going to grab my bat and I'm going to get the ball. I'm going to hit the ball, and uh, and if it does not work, man, I will, I'm going to talk to Joe Boo. The thing he was most focused on, Dennis was really working on, was the accent, was the Cuban accent, and it's 100% spot on. He doesn't. There aren't any scenes where you can hear it falling out. She ain't got to come from. Dennis, completely unknown guy at the time, and yet another testament to David's wisdom in casting. I mean, how he knew that Dennis would be just perfect for Pedro Serrano. I asked Joe Boo to come. Take fear from bats. And having Joe Boo for me, you know, I just sort of just locked in. I mean, that's what Pedro was supposed to be about. So that's what I was about. When I first saw him, I just knew he was the guy to play Serrano, because he was big and had that great voice. And he was also a great ball player. The, the shot in the final game, when he hits that home run, he actually hit that ball out of the park. That was exhilarating. I hit a couple of them. Uh, every home run I was supposed to hit out, I hit out. And Steve Yeager will say that, you know, it was cool, but he didn't like it at the end because he was pitching. <laughs> Dennis, as Pedro Serrano, all, invented as many things for his characters as any of the other characters did. He always had good notions of who that character was and how he should act and what he should say. Say, fuck you, Jobu. I do it myself. Would you like to manage the Indians this year? I don't know. I don't think you could have cast anybody more perfect to be the coach of a team. Forget about the curveball, Ricky. Give him a heater. James Gamm has always been one of my favorite actors. I, I'd always wanted to use him in a movie, and when I got the idea for the manager, who's, you know, basically running a tire store and is not even sure he wants to manage the Cleveland Indians, <laughs> you know, I'd mean, rather manage a tire store than, than actually be manager of the Indians. I just thought James was the perfect guy. I'd like to hang around and see if we can give them all a nice big shit burger to eat. <laughs> you know, he's like rough, you know, he's got, he's got the voice and everything. He's sort, of, he's sort of like, you know, you kind of think of him. He is kind of like Casey Stengel or, you know, that kind of a baseball character. 
just looked the part, sounded the part. You can you can just picture him as that guy that that was you know chasing the ring for 30 years. Enjoyed Jimmy. He was a good man. He he liked to have a good time too. I think he uh, he and the boys went out at night. James Gammon is just a spectacular actor. I'm sure there were managers that you know that emulated him. He just zeroed in on what a manager is, and uh, and that's what he was. He was the manager. Which will bring up Haywood, who leads the league in most offensive categories, including nose hair. Pete Vukovic, we originally brought in uh, to because we were interested in someone to play the big Yankee relief pitcher. But what happened was when David saw him, when we brought him in as the pitcher, David saw and said, well, how are we going to do better than this as the guy who's sort of the big Thurman Munson-like bad guy Yankee slugger? I can remember coming into County Stadium at about 5.30 a.m. and finding Vukovic eating a hot dog and drinking a Heineken. And he had uh, lots of stories. You know, he was, uh, he was a good baseball man. And, of course, a lot of Vukovic's dialogue when he comes up to hit is improvised, you know. That's your wife and my kids. I didn't write that. That was pure Lukovic. He was a wild guy. And he bought, he bought a great sort of attitude to it. You ought to open your stance a little. They're pitching you inside. Rene Russo was a complete unknown, famous model, but she hadn't worked. It was her first movie. She was an experience, very nervous at first. But once she, uh, once she calmed down, she was just great. She had a wonderful quality about her that just made you love her. And I just thought, you know, uh, I think people are going to really like her. Here's to the thrill of defeat, Charlie. For this evil ex-showgirl wife of this owner who really knew what he was doing, who's just now inherited the club. Every time the Indians do something good, she's very upset. We've discovered that audiences really love to hate her. I think Margaret Whitten did such a good job of making that character evil that the audience just loved to hate her. What are they? A bunch of pansies. Hello again, everybody. Harry Doyle here, welcoming all you friends of the feather to another season of Indians baseball. When David gave me the the, the freedom to, to be this guy, it really wasn't anything too much different than what I'd do on a regular broadcast. Euchre's always been, you know, uh, he's always been funny. He was in Mr. Belvedere, I had a sitcom. And he's always been funny with other ball players because he was like a 220 lifetime hitter or something. Good catcher, but not a great hitter. And, and he's the first one to make jokes about himself. So I thought, you know, Uke, because he is a broadcaster, would be great to play Harry Doyle. You know, to meet those guys and know that uh, they were doing a baseball film. I didn't know Charlie Sheen could throw as well as he did. He threw pretty good. I could hit him, but I, he threw pretty good. Um, I might have went yard on him. I know I would have. But it became, over the years now, I mean, it's all of those things, it, it may be one, one sentence, whatever, one catchphrase, and it becomes a part of Americana, you know? It's, it's everybody says it. Just a bit outside, he tried the corner and missed. It was great to have actors who knew the game well enough, who, who had comic abilities, even though they weren't comedians. A comedy like this works. There's all sorts of little scenes and moments that aren't exactly scripted. And again, testament to David Ward, that he allowed those moments. I guess that's one of the things about the movie that's so great is that there's some funny stuff, but it's never about anybody making a joke. I mean, Jim Gammon's reaction to pissing on my contract. There's no joke there. My, I got the joke pissing on the contract. His look and reaction of just like, uh, you know, is... It's classic, but it's, there's no, there's no, you know, and that's what makes the movie work. There's a famous line from Major League, which isn't in the movie, but I think you can talk to a lot of people who saw Major League who think that it was, and the reason for that is it's in the trailer. That ball wouldn't have been out of a lot of parks. Name one. Yellowstone. <laughs> <laughs> Not in the picture, but in the trailer and a classic line. One of the real thrills of making the movie was shooting in front of these large crowds. I mean, it was such a rush for the, for the actors. We had 25,000 fans in the uh, stadium, and, um, and they were supposed to erupt in this big roar before we took the field. And I had goosebumps rising up on my arm. 
And uh, Steve Yeager looked at me and gave me a little nudge. He says, that's what it's like 162 times a year. We shot most of Major League. We shot all of principal photography in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. We just couldn't work around the Indian schedule or the other schedule for the ballpark. Jacobs Field had not been built yet. The interesting thing about shooting in Milwaukee is that the people there are so great. I think they just loved having us. They just loved that we were making a movie about baseball at all. Uh, so they were very friendly to us. It was a tremendous place to make the picture. Everybody was into it, they were singing it, were dancing. All those girls dancing on the dugout, we didn't ask them to do it, they just started to do it. They just got into it, it was, it was great. A lot of the big closers now come out to very dramatic music, and uh, that, I, I sort of like to think we started that trend with Major League. It was really flattering to, to see Major Leaguers change their uniform numbers to 99, to play Wild Thing when they come out of the bullpen, to, to, to adopt this whole Wild Thing demeanor that was in a, in a film. I mean, that was the ultimate compliment. Here comes the 1-1 pitch. Taylor Bunt! Really, this movie is written from a place that's the most pure you can get. Yeah, his, you know, his Indians never won. And the guy's gonna get him there. And he did. Three, three. A lot of things have moved on in baseball, but a lot of it will always be the same. You know, the heart of it is still there. And Major League has that kind of, that kind of real solid basis in, in the game. Just well done, you know, it's just very well done. It's a great come from behind story. The team takes over. One guy steps up, the next guy steps up, and the next guy steps up. And it was a feel good movie. The feelings that it had from the locker room to the field um, to all the uh, all the behind the scenes areas that it that it went to this day it's uh, it's probably one of very few that really captured the essence of life in the big leagues and that that part of it's really gratifying to me and I think all the guys who are in it and associated with it feel that same way anytime you watch the movie anytime I watch the movie if I just watch it for five minutes, I see something where I go, that's good. <laughs>